Welcome to Intro to Functional Programming in Haskell. Today we'll be talking about Lambda Calculus. So, what is it and why are we talking about it? Well, it's easiest to draw a parallel to Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra is to computer science in general as Lambda Calculus is to functional programming. Boolean algebra provides a system of simple structures and rules about how those structures can interact from which we can infer more advanced principles. In a similar fashion, Lambda Calculus provides a system from which we can infer advanced principles that are more relevant to functional programming. Programs collect, modify, and transmit data. Now the individual pieces of programs that do the data modification, collection, and transmission on a more microscopic scale are functions. Since functions are the individual building blocks of programs, it then makes sense to study the way functions, arguments, and values can interact. So, lambda calculus represents a function with something called a lambda expression. A lambda expression has a head and a body. And, by the way, the backslash is used to represent the lambda in a lambda expression oftentimes because it is easier to type or more accessible than bothering to insert an actual lambda. So, in lambda calculus, the head of the function essentially holds the function parameters, and the body describes what the function returns or results in. We'll look at these things more carefully in a minute, but for now here are some examples. In the first example, we have a lambda expression that describes a function that simply takes an argument and gives it back. It takes an A and returns that A. Now that A might be the number 3. You put 3 in this function, it'll return 3. You put the letter h in this function, it'll return the letter h. The second example describes a function that takes an argument and simply ignores it. Give it anything and it always gives back whatever z is. So let's talk more about how we actually fill arguments into lambda expressions and more complex expressions in general. So, much like in mathematical expressions, when two numbers are next to each other in parentheses, or one number is parenthesized and the other is not, we assume that those numbers are multiplied together. In lambda calculus, a lambda expression may be applied to an argument that it is next to. So, this more complex expression of lambda a returning a next to a 3 is saying that this lambda should be applied to the argument 3. Also, this is a more interesting take on functions in general. Functions are applied to their arguments. We don't actually fill arguments into the functions. The functions happen to the arguments. Also, as a note, for our study of lambda calculus, usually we're more interested in generic situations, such as applying a function to another unknown or generic variable. We don't usually study the application of a function to the actual character A or the number 12. However, we could do that if we wanted. In general, we're applying functions to other generic variables, such as seen below, where we apply lambda A, which returns AZ, to the generic variable B, resulting in BZ. On a similar note, let's talk about the final meaning of lambda expression bodies. Don't be too troubled by the final meaning of lambda bodies, especially if you decide to apply a lambda expression to something specific like the letter A or the number 5. We get to decide what that final meaning is for things that are sitting next to each other. For example, if you apply the letter A to the lambda expression that takes an A and returns three A's right next to each other, that would become the letter A next to the letter A next to the letter A. A lot of people would probably assume that this results in a string of three A's, but that is not a mandatory assumption. Similarly, if you replace the letter A with the number 3 and applied this lambda expression to the number 3 and got 333, three, three, plenty of people would assume that that implied 3 times 3 times 3. However, that is not mandatory. We are, again, more interested in generic situations where that final meaning is not as relevant for now. Lambda expressions can be applied to lambda expressions, by the way. So when a lambda is applied to another lambda, you just fill in the second lambda as you would if it were a regular variable. In the example shown here, 
We have lambda A returning AB applied to lambda X returning XX. So we apply the first lambda to the second. Lambda X returning XX replaces A in the first lambda, which is shown in the second step. Once you've successfully fully replaced A, you can eliminate the head portion of that first lambda and just look at the simplified lambda. We end up with lambda X returning XX applied to B, in which case we end up with a final lambda B returning BB. We can eliminate that head portion now that the argument has been filled in and we end up with a final expression of just BB. So more formally what's going on here when we apply functions to arguments is that arguments are replacing the bound forms of variables in the function body. What I mean by this is if a variable such as A or B also appears in the head of a lambda expression, that means whenever that letter is replaced in the head of the lambda expression that that variable is also replaced in the body of that lambda expression with the same thing. For example, when we apply lambda a returning aa to something like b or 3, you get bb or 33 3 back. That is because the a binds the a's in the body of the lambda expression. Anything that that a becomes is what those a's become. This way of replacing variables in the body due to their nature of being bound to a parameter in the head gives rise to an interesting property that we call alpha equivalence. Essentially what alpha equivalence is, is the fact that you can rename any parameter that appears in the head of a function and replace those bound variables in the body of the function without changing the true identity of the function at all. As in the example shown here, lambda a returning aa is the same as lambda b returning bb. It's just a function that takes a parameter and gives you back two of your original parameter. On a similar note, the body of a lambda expression might contain something called a free variable. Free variables are any variable that appear in the body but not in the head, meaning they aren't bound to anything. For example, if you have a function lambda a returning z, where the z is something that gets returned no matter what, and your a that you pass in is just something that is ignored, the z is a free variable. Furthermore, alpha equivalence does not apply to free variables. Lambda a returning az is not the same as lambda a returning a y, even though lambda a returning a y is the same thing as lambda b returning b y. The reason being that z and y, since they are not bound, could essentially signify constants of some kind that are unique to the function and not necessarily interchangeable with one another. So the process of taking a complex expression that involves multiple lambdas and standalone variables and applying lambdas until you can't anymore is called beta reduction. Function application in general is carried out by the leftmost and outermost function in the expression. Also, lambdas may contain other lambdas in their bodies from their definition. In the example shown here, we have a lambda a returning a contained lambda b that returns a b z applied to q r. First, the outermost function absorbs the q as a part of function application, becoming the second form seen here, and then the r gets absorbed by the application of the lambda b returning q b z. Notice that the A still binds the A that is inside of the nested lambda expression. As you may have noticed so far, we've only considered lambda expressions that take only one parameter. As a matter of fact, within lambda calculus, all lambda expressions may only have one parameter. So the question is then, how do we write functions that take multiple arguments. Well, the key is to look back to what we just discussed, which is that parameters bind variables that appear in nested lambda expressions. So you can actually write a sort of multi-parameter function by simply just nesting 
a function inside of another function and not having anything outside of the most deeply nested function. In this example, if we look at lambda AB returning ABZ, which is something we might want to be able to write, we can actually express it in terms of separate lambdas that only take one argument by simply nesting lambda B returning ABZ inside of lambda A as the body of that lambda A expression. And as a matter of fact, this notation of writing lambda AB returning ABZ is actually accepted because it is assumed that when you want something that takes multiple arguments, you actually are implying such a nesting of very trivial lambda expressions. Now, within lambda calculus, there are some special expressions. So not every expression ends up reducing down to a lone lambda by itself or a single lone variable. Some expressions diverge, such as shown here. Lambda xx applied to lambda xx ends up becoming lambda xx applied to lambda xx after function application. Meaning, while you can continue to apply lambda xx to lambda xx, it never simplifies. So this expression is divergent. Another special kind of expression is a combinator. Combinators take parameters and simply rearrange them or restate them in a special way. The identifying quality of a combinator is that it has no free variables. And finally, it is worthwhile to note that the order of arguments is important within lambda calculus. As shown below, if you have lambda AB returning AQBR applied to CD, the final structure returned by this lambda expression is CQDR. However, if you take the same expression and apply it to DC, you get DQCR. Order is important, and combinators can actually be useful for putting things in the form or order we need. That concludes our first lecture. Please like and subscribe if you plan on following the series. See you next time.